Erin woke up with a scream. Her dirty blonde hair was damp with sweat, and her pajamas were twisted from the tossing and turning. It was that dream again. She has been getting this recurring dream fairly regularly for the last two years, but now it's almost every night. She had even been taking a pill at night since she was seven to help combat these nightmares. Apparently, they had been really bad when she was younger, but she didn't remember it. The medication had worked for a long time, but now they were back. It had gotten so bad that her parents had her see a psychologist to see if there is any reason for her to be getting this dream so frequently. Dr. Abar suggested she write them down as soon as she woke up from them in order to get as much of it down as possible before it faded away. That way, they can look at times, days, stresses, and see if there is a pattern. She pulled her dream journal out of her nightstand drawer and opened it to a blank page as she turned on the light to dispel the darkness. Her mother peeked in the doorway, clutching a pink fuzzy bathrobe at the neck. Are you okay? She whispered. Yeah, it's just that same stupid dream. I don't get why it makes me scream and wake up like that. Well, try and get back to sleep. I will, Erin promised. Her mother closed the door and headed back to bed. Erin sighed and began writing. April 15th, 1985. 1.49 a.m. The dream started the same way as last time. It was like watching a black and white movie with the sound off. Dad was driving. Mom was in the passenger seat, and I sat behind Dad, like I always do. It was nighttime and it was raining heavily. The windshield wipers were at full speed, but you still could barely see out of the windshield. I don't know how Dad managed. Suddenly the sound starts, but it's squealing tires and glass shattering. I'm in pain, but I don't know why. I wake up to being dragged out of the car with rain soaking everything. The man helping me up doesn't seem to notice the nearly paralyzed left side of my body. Something warm is running down my left eye when I realize I can't see out of it. But I don't panic. I should have been panicking, but I'm not. The man is older, perhaps a little older than my dad, and looks familiar to me, but I don't know why. I've never seen him before except in these dreams. He leads me toward a path with five branches off of it, it's now when I realize that everything is in color and the rain has stopped. You need to choose, he says, pointing to the paths. But I can't move anymore. I'm just in too much pain for it. The scene shifted. I was at a party, but I still looked like hell. No one seemed to say anything about how I looked. It was as if it was normal for them. I didn't recognize anyone, and I was hobbling around looking for my parents, but it was like I knew they weren't there. It was like a different version of one of those dreams where you run but don't get anywhere. The scene shifts again, and I'm outside. It looks like a forest or woodsy area of some sort. I hear twigs snapping, so I turn in that direction. It's nighttime, and I see two glowing eyes. The moon is full, so I can see what it is. It's a wolf. It's huge. It's smaller than a horse, but still bigger than a pony. It walks towards me and then suddenly springs at me. That's when I wake up screaming. The weird part is that I don't feel like I should be afraid of this giant wolf. There isn't a fear feeling in the dream even when it springs at me. But I wake up screaming anyway, and my heart beats like it's coming out of my chest. Erin closes the notebook and sets it back in the nightstand drawer. As she drifts off to sleep, she remembers, Today's my 17th birthday. The alarm clock wakes her up the next morning. She lets it go for a few moments as she rubs her eyes. Morning came too soon. She turned the alarm off as she got up and got ready for the day. Breakfast is a quick bowl of cereal by herself. Her mom and dad have already left for work. On the counter, next to the sink, is a note from her dad. Happy birthday, kiddo. I hope today is perfect. Don't make any plans with your friends because you're all ours tonight. Dinner at Olive Garden, and then we were thinking of taking you to see the Goonies tonight. Check the listing in the paper, and let us know if there's something you would rather go see. Love Mom and Dad. There is space at the bottom, so Aaron adds, The Goonies sounds great. After she rinsed out her bowl, she got her book bag and jacket and headed to the bus stop. Her best friend, Kelly Anderson, is waiting for her. 
Slowpoke, I've been waiting for you. Erin took a look at her Swatch watch. It was the same time she always came to the bus stop. Geez, Kelly, I'm on time. It's you that's early. Oh, whatever. Here, I made you this. Kelly hands Aaron a cassette tape that you can record stuff on. There's a handwritten label on it that says, Happy 17th birthday. I made you a mixtape. I had to keep calling in for them to play songs on the radio so I could get them all. She smiled. This is so amazing. I can't wait to listen to it. I even filled out the jacket. Kelly explained, showing her the list of songs she was able to record for her. You're the best. Thank you so much. It was a mixture of songs from Queen, Foreigner, Michael Jackson, Twisted Sister, and Poison. What are you doing tonight? Mom and Dad are taking me out for dinner and a movie. Really? What are you going to see? The Goonies. Lucky! It's been all anyone at school has been talking about. You gotta let me know how it is. The school bus pulled up as Aaron replied in the affirmative. The school day was normal, with teachers giving out homework because it's Friday and they will have all weekend to do it. As if students want to be working on boring old homework all weekend. When they got off the bus at the end of the day, Aaron waved goodbye to Kelly and headed home. Her parents welcomed her home with a chorus of happy birthday, and after she had set down her backpack, they handed her a present to open. It was the new Atari system and a few games. Holy cow, guys! This is so awesome! Thank you so much! Erin exclaimed. She gave them both a huge hug. We need to head out to dinner now, so we will be able to make it to the movie on time, her dad suggested. Everyone got jackets on and headed out to the car. They all hated the songs and spectacles that came with telling a restaurant it was your birthday, so it was an unspoken rule that no one tell the staff of birthdays. They made it to the movie with time to spare and picked great seats. Aaron's favorite part was the speech Mouth gave at the bottom of the well. While they were in the theater, the skies had darkened and rain had begun to fall. They laughed as they ran to the car trying to avoid getting rained on. As they rode home, the rain got heavier and heavier. It seemed like the windshield wipers couldn't keep up. They stayed quiet so that her dad could concentrate on the road. Even the radio that usually played was off. Aaron didn't even see the car that smashed into the driver's side of the car. All she heard was the sound of tires squealing, the breaking of glass, and the crunching of metal before darkness took her. She was dreaming. She knew she was dreaming because it was like every other dream she had had like this. Someone pulled her clear of the car wreck, but she knew this was not reality. This was... something else. It was vivid and seemed real, but she noticed that the physical sensations were not as solid. The rain falling on her did not soak her clothing. The near useless left arm and leg hurt, but they didn't hurt like they should for the condition they were in. The man again guided her to a place with five paths leading away. Choose, he said. This time she could move. The first path had what looked like a huge battle playing out down it. There was even an aerial battle with what looked like angels and demons. The second path had a huge hedge maze. The hedges were so tall that you couldn't see over them even if you stood on someone else's shoulders. She could hear people crying out as though lost from within. The third path had blood-covered stairs heading down into a crypt-like tomb. The fourth path had a metal grate that looked like it had hot coals underneath. There were also huge suits of armor with all manner of weapons in their hands positioned like a gauntlet down this path. The fifth and final path looked like a jungle. Out in front of it were severed heads on poles with flies all around them. From inside the jungle came the sounds of a jungle, along with the sounds of predators stalking prey and the occasional sounds of a human being eaten. These were all horrible choices. The third path with the blood looked promising. Maybe her parents went down there and that's why there was all that blood. She dragged herself over to that path and headed down the couple stairs to the interior of the crypt. As soon as she entered, the door slammed behind her, locking her in. She tried to push against it, but it wouldn't budge. There was a little light here, 
There were torches spaced intermittently, but didn't cast much light onto the floor. She could hear the skittering of rodents and the small movement of what sounded like stone, moving with the rodents' movements. A torch was nearby, so she dragged herself over to it and pulled it from its sconce. She lowered the torch so she could see the floor better and saw it was littered with bones, cockroaches, and rats, the cockroaches and rats fleeing from the light. She gasped at the shock. She couldn't go back. She could only go forward. Her parents could still be down here. Maybe. Her left arm and leg were almost useless, so she could only drag her leg behind herself and put minimal weight on it as she moved down this narrow stone corridor. As she hobbled, rats skittered across her feet as they were getting away from her. Some nipped at her legs. The path remained unchanged for what felt like a mile. She was resting when she heard a weird shuffling coming from ahead. She held out the torch to try and get a better view, but still couldn't see anything. Hello? she called out. The shuffling stopped for a moment and then started up again, but now sounded like it was coming toward her. In the faint torchlight, she could finally see what was coming. They looked like zombies. What was she supposed to do? She just had the torch. She looked around and found a femur. She transferred the torch to her left hand. It felt a little better now, and she was able to hold the torch. She just wouldn't be able to hold it up and out, just kind of out and down. The femur was now in her right hand, and the dead were coming closer. There was no point in going back the way she came. There wasn't any turnoffs to hide down, and the door at the very end was closed. The first that reached her, she touched with the torch, and it went up quickly and without a trace like toilet paper. She was hoping that they would ignite each other, but the fire had no chance to spread. She tried to keep them away from her, but there were too many. Eventually, they began biting and tearing at her until she fell unconscious. She woke up in pain. She was still in the stone hallway. She took stock of her body, and even though her clothes were torn, there was little real damage. In fact, her left arm and leg felt a little stronger. She now had stitches in multiple places. Her left side was still really weak, but felt a little sturdier. Did the zombies fix her up? She definitely had bite marks, so what happened? There was no sign of them anywhere. It took great effort, but she slowly stood up and took a new torch from the wall sconce, as her other one had disappeared. After some time, she came to what felt like a dead end. This room was circular and was piled high with bones. They seemed to spiral around like a ramp. When she looked up, she realized there was an opening. She found the end of the ramp and put her foot down on it. It was not overly stable, so she got down on her belly and did her best to army crawl up the ramp. It was slow and painful, as sharp bones dug into her, but the shifting was lessened. She had no idea how much time had passed because she didn't get tired in the same way. It was a long time, and she was filthy and exhausted by the time she reached the lip of this oubliette. She dragged herself over. She had slipped back many times in her climb and thought she was going to tumble all the way down over and over, but she made it. She curled up into the fetal position and fell asleep. When she woke up, she was sore from sleeping on stone. Her torch was gone again, but this place had torches in sconces along the wall. The light was dim, but she could see most of the outline of the pit she had crawled out of. She pulled a torch from a sconce and looked around. There were stone slabs on the walls with plaques on them. She looked at a few of them and noticed they had her same last name, Blackwell. She had never met any of these people and the dates went back further as she continued on. This chamber was rectangular with the circular pit in the middle. It didn't take long for her to make it back to the beginning. She did, however, notice a name that had just appeared, Dustin Blackwell, her father's name, and then Carolyn Blackwell appeared as well. This is a crypt. Does that mean my parents are dead? The plaques bearing their names also had their birth and death dates. They had both died April 16, 1985. But that's tomorrow, isn't it? How long have I been asleep? I don't see my name on any of these walls, so does that mean I'm alive? Aaron headed to the door. It was a solid wood door that didn't appear to have a lock on it. 
She tried the handle, and it opened easily. She stepped outside and smelled the air. It was a little stale, but not as bad as the crypt had been. There was a light breeze that carried tiny bits of dirt and dust that she could feel hitting her exposed skin. It was nighttime, and though there were stars in the sky, the night was moonless. She looked around and saw that this was the only structure there. There weren't even other graves or mausoleums. She stepped out onto the land, and dry dirt crunched beneath her feet, kicking up a little more dirt and dust. Vegetation was sparse, but there was a dead-looking tree about fifty yards ahead of her. She looked all around, and there was nothing besides that dead tree and the mausoleum she had just exited. The only thing that seemed to have any real color was the torch in her hand. The rest, even when brought close to the torchlight, seemed to be in shades of gray, even her own skin. She headed over to the tree and saw a lone crow sitting on one of the branches. It cawed at her, and she could see it had a damaged eye. Even though it appeared to be blind in that eye, she could tell it was still looking at her with it. It was unnerving, so she walked past the tree, looking for any change in the horizon. It was many days of traveling, and the night sky never changed. It never became day, and the moon never shone on the land. Sometimes she heard wolves in the distance, but they rarely seemed to get close to her, for which she was thankful. She never got hungry or thirsty, but she did notice that she was losing weight. Her arm and leg marginally improved, but she was unable to run, and she was always walking with a limp and with pain. She never regained sight in her left eye, either. She knew it was open, but if she covered her right eye, she couldn't see anything. The crow seemed to follow her and at times seemed to lead her. She had nowhere else to go, so followed the strange bird. She felt like she wandered for years in this desolate place and had several run-ins with the wolves. They tried to attack, but her torch kept them away. When one tried to attack, she hid it with the torch, and just like the zombies before, it went up like toilet paper does. After that, the wolves would run away, unwilling to meet the same end, only for others to come and attack again. Aaron didn't know how long she traveled. It could have been days, months, years, or even decades. The sky never changed. She never became hungry or thirsty. However, her body did change. It became thinner and weaker. While her left arm was no longer completely useless, and her left leg no longer dragged behind her as she walked, they were not completely healed either. Eventually, the horizon changed. Where it was once flat, there was now a weird triangle pointing upwards. As she continued to walk towards it, the triangle seemed to rise into the sky. She soon came to realize it was a tower of some kind. Seeing something other than the dead land made her happy. As she approached, a human figure stood in front of her. This was the first person she encountered and was apprehensive. The figure was cloaked, and she couldn't see any of this person's skin. Even its face was covered. It stood holding a sickle. Is this what it's like when you die? Do you actually see the Grim Reaper? Hello, Aaron Blackwell. You have traveled long and far to find me. You must make a decision now. The voice was a weird timber that made it so that she couldn't identify if it was male or female by voice. It gestured for her to come closer. There are two paths behind me. The path to the right will take you to your parents, and your journey will end. The path to the left leads to the tower. Inside you will unlock your power. It will not be an easy road, but it will have its own rewards. But you will be without your parents. Choose. He stepped to the side and gestured to the paths. Aaron looked over to the right, and her parents stood there, looking at her with love. She wanted to go to them, but knew that if she did, that meant she would die. Despite everything, she wasn't ready to die just yet. I love you, Mom and Dad, but I can't be with you just yet. She turned to the path on the left and headed towards the tower. The path was not long, and the door came into view shortly. It was easy to open, and she stepped inside. The tower was completely hollow. There were no stairs or upper floors. In the center of the tower's floor was a book on a pedestal. 
It was open, and there was an old-fashioned ink, well, and quill pen next to it. Written in the book were names. There was nothing else to do, so she took the quill, dipped it in the ink, and then signed her name. Somewhere overhead, that she couldn't see, a bell was rung. It was loud to her being within the tower. She couldn't see it, but it sounded like it was directly overhead with how loud it sounded. Bong! Bong! And then it began to change. Beep! Beep! The room became bright until it was so white it was blinding. She had no choice but to close her eyes. She felt so weak. And she was... Laying down? Beep! Beep! She opened her eyes and saw she was not in the tower, but in a hospital room. The beeping was due to the machines she was hooked up to. Hey everyone, hope you loved the video. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe for more awesome sci-fi content. You can also support us by hitting the thanks button at the bottom of the video. Your generosity goes a long way. Every bit helps us bring you more stories from the stars. Thanks a bunch.